God, <clears throat> bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. Yesterday, as we all know, marked the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on our country. And last night, as the Mets and the Yankees met once again to play baseball, there were the police and the firefighters and the first responders and the families of all those individually and personally affected by all that happened on that day. I was reminded not only of our time in New York, but of the reality of evil in this world and the need for our great nation, as you see in the image, to point ourselves upward in prayer and devotion and submission in the love of God, the fear of God, and the dependence upon God. All of our monuments, all of our achievements, all the things that we might erect pale before the awesome majesty of the sovereign God. And our trust is not in anything here, not in ourselves or anyone here. It is in Him. And when we pray, God bless America, we ask God to guide, to steer, to direct this great land that we love. Through the night, as we live in such a dark time, with the light from above. It was when Jesus finished praying that his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And in such simple and clear, understandable terms, Jesus talked about coming before God as our Father, revering Him, honoring Him, submitting to Him, seeking Him, thanking Him, and asking Him to have His kingdom and His will and His guidance in our lives. Many of you took the opportunity to respond when I asked you about children's prayers because Jesus compared prayer to a child that's hungry coming to its father and asking for something to eat. Rhonda, you told me that when your niece was four years old, she asked her dad, just exactly how far away does God live? He answered, God lives in a wonderful place called heaven. The four-year-old said, can we take a vacation and go see you? She said, no, they were told, no, it's far away. Well, how can God hear my prayers if he lives at such a distance? And so she was assured no matter where she was, God's always listening and hearing her prayers. Later that night, it was bedtime. It was time to pray. And so the four-year-old changed her routine. She hopped up in the middle of the bed. She stood on the bed, clasped her hands together, closed her eyes, looked up, and began to pray in the loudest voice she could muster. Her daddy said, said, why are you praying so loudly? She said, I wanted to make sure God could hear me. Christy told me about a couple of their experiences that some time ago when Elise was quite young, she said, thank you for grace, my nightlight, french fries, mayonnaise, my ham and cheese sandwich, and God and Jesus. And little Ava, the younger girl sometime back said, Dear God, thank you for Mommy and Paschetti. Please help the coronavirus go away. Thank you for the workers who built our perfect house. Amen. And JC said that when Hattie was in kindergarten, she prayed, Please don't let us get on our teacher's nerves tomorrow. N-E-R-D-S. Dwight Moody said, I'd rather be able to pray than become a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. Our Lord Tennyson, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day, 
For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life without the brain? If, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer but over themselves and those who call them friends. Thomas Aquinas, give me, O Lord, a steadfast heart which no one worthy affection may drag downwards. Give me an unconquered heart, which no tribulation can wear out. Give me an upright heart, which no unworthy person may tempt aside. When Jesus talked about prayer, he began with intimacy. Abba, Father, we read in Romans 8, 14 through 17, that there is a closeness to God. There is a relationship with God. Though he is far away, we don't have to shout. He is as close to us as we would have him to be. Jesus could have begun with our king, our creator, our judge, our authority, our ruler. But he began with our father. And he created the picture of the child in need who knows that the Father's arms and his heart and his ears are open, that his resources are available, that out of his compassion and his wisdom and his awareness, he can provide whatever that child needs. Abba was such a term used for a father by a little child. In heaven makes us think of that distance that's also a reality that God is over all. He is supreme, and he sees from his own vantage point what we do not. And so we don't approach him flippantly or casually or comfortably. There's always this sense in which he is God and I am not. And so I bow before him, bringing my life and my will under his dominion. In each area of prayer, we could develop conversation with God. Because you are my Father, I will, I won't, I love, I reject. Or because you are in heaven and your name is hallowed, it's to be set apart. Therefore, this will be my life. God's kingdom. Obviously, you compare this with Matthew 6, what we often call the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That is, God rule my life, my marriage, my relationships, my family. God rule my efforts in the workplace. God, let what you want be seen in what I say and what I do and how I think and the way I present myself. The plea for the daily bread reminds us that no request is too small or too large. And those things that we need to support ourselves to go through this life, everything has a spiritual component. And so we don't compartmentalize our food from our work, from our recreation or from anything else in our lives. We bring it all before God. Forgive us our debts. The idea that sin is entered in God's book as a debit that we ask might be erased. And building upon that, God, these are the debts in my life. This is what I said. This is what I should have done. This is how I yielded. This is what I know you would have me have done differently. And we can be specific and clear and personal because God knows it all anyway. Jesus said in Matthew 6 that your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. Ask Him anyway. And don't worry about what you'll eat and what you'll drink and what you'll wear and what will happen tomorrow how long you'll be on this earth. All those things, Jesus said, those without a father seek. Together with that contrition, forgive me my debts, and here they are, Lord, is a condition. I have forgiven all of those who are indebted to me. And those words roll off the tongue, but you and I can 
name, we can enumerate the people who have wronged us, who have offended us. Someone says, can I forgive a person who doesn't ask for forgiveness? Well, he doesn't grant the forgiveness unless he comes for it. It turns from sin, but I can let go of that entry in my book, and I can wipe it out and delete it as I come to God in prayer. Lead us not into temptation. That is, keep us away. Deliver us from evil. Lord, direct my steps. Remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your steps. And then this simple story. Let me ask you, how many of us appreciate a midnight knock at the door? I don't see a lot of hands. I remember when we lived outside Philadelphia. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. And there was a banging and banging and banging on the door. You know what I did? I rolled over. You know what happened? Bang, bang, bang. You know what I finally realized? That person wasn't going away until I answered the door. So I got up and I opened it. It was the police. You know I was excited. They said, there's a car way back in your backyard, and all the doors of that car are open. And we were concerned maybe somebody had broken into your car. I was so glad they knocked on my door. I was a little bit ashamed, because I was the one that had left all the doors on the car open. I'd been working on a project, adding something to the inside of the car, and I got a phone call earlier in the day, and I rushed into the house to answer it. I forgot all about the car. The police didn't. Do you answer the door when it's a stranger? Or when it's a neighbor? Or they didn't text you first? Do you have a video doorbell so that you could say, oh, I'm not going to... But here's someone coming at midnight. I've had a guest come. I'm out of food. And in Israel, not too different from today, it was shameful. It was an embarrassment for company to arrive and you didn't have food to give them. I think I've told you before about the little boy that was asked to pray when the family had all the people in the house. And he said, Mommy, I don't know what to pray. She said, just pray what you've always heard your mommy pray. And so he prayed, dear God, why did I invite all these people into my house to eat today? And so going with a cup of sugar, right? Or whatever other staple might be necessary. Hey, someone has come. I'm ashamed. I, I, I don't have a provision. And so the man inside says, and you and I can relate to this if we're honest, go away. My kids are in bed. You know what that means? I'm in bed too. And, and Jesus, Jesus said, said yet yeah, because of the man's Doug read impudence. impudence. See that in the ESV? It, it can, can also be understood as insolence, insolence shamelessness, shamelessness, rudeness. Who ever thought that Jesus would name a person in his parable with that quality? But that's why, the, that's why, he, that's why he was persistent. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give up. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go away. away. And so, the response is, basically, I'm not going to get rid of this guy until I open up the pantry and give him what he needs. Jesus is not saying that the Father is like that, far from it. He is eager. He is waiting. And yet, the attitude of keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And in the Greek text, these are continual terms. It's not ask once and then go away. Again and again and again. It will be given to you. You will find it. God will open that door. And we're quick to say, if, but, as long as, and we understand, ask according to God's will, seek the kingdom first and his righteousness, knock on the door that God would have you go through, 
But you see, we've already prayed that your will be done. I am yours. What I want is what you would have in my life. So under that banner, with that cover, this is what I'm asking. Remember James 4? You don't have, why? Because you don't ask. Really? What is there that God would do in my life or in your life if I would simply ask him? He can do it anyway, but he won't do it unless I come before him with my petition. Seeking God. The Bible says that God seeks us. Remember James 4 or John 4? Jesus told the Samaritan woman, Worship God in spirit and truth, for such worshipers the Father seeks. God seeks those that are seeking Him. What door are we approaching? What are we asking God to provide, to supply? And then this child asked its father, I want a fish. Well, here's a snake, so I'll try that. I mean, Jesus' stories, they're so graphic, and they're so clear, and there's, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Well, Dad, how about an egg? Well, let's try the scorpion. I've heard they could be interesting to eat. No. And so then Jesus makes this contrast. If you, being evil, and what he means by that is that we are sinners, we're not God, our motives are not perfect, our resources are limited, but if we know how to give our children what's good, how much more will God give, in Luke's account, the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You and I know that we receive the Holy Spirit when we repent of sin and we're baptized into Christ. We read that in Acts 2.38. God gives his spirit to all those who obey him that way, Acts 5, 32. Then the Bible exhorts us in Ephesians 5 to be filled with the spirit. And notice what the fruit of the spirit involves, love, and joy, and peace. And earlier in that chapter, singing, admonishing, teaching, giving thanks, yielding to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so we grow in our relationship with God, continually asking Him that His presence and His light might be that which leads us forward. The practical ideas for your prayers and mine. Acts 2.42, the early church those 3,000 or so devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Aren't you thankful that this is a praying church? Tanya and I were talking earlier about the topic of prayer. We were noting the fact that the way we do these requests and the way we respond and the way that we ask God's help and we send cards and we reach out to people and we tell one another, social media and in person, I'm praying for you. I care about you. I'm devoted to prayer. Our prayer is to be thoughtful. Jesus said, don't go by rote. And, and just, just think, think that, that because, because you, you say, say a lot of words, words somehow, somehow your prayer carries more weight. weight. Notice how short his prayer was. And yet it was so sincere. Honestly, praying means that we lay our souls bare before God. Is it proper to tell God when we're angry, disappointed, offended, to talk to him as the psalmist did with complaint and lament? Or as Jeremiah the prophet cried out to him in his agony? 
Is it all right to talk to God about a situation that we think he's put us in or he's allowed for us and it's disturbing and troubling for us? Is there anything we don't talk to God about because we think he doesn't know it? What if we pray based on our needs, based on our worries, based on our fears, based on our doubts? What if we take all that is in our lives and convert it to something I need to talk to God about, that he knows, and I want to ask and seek and knock? You can take the scripture in your time in the Word and write down each theme, each principle. Perhaps in our study of Romans, you were in chapter 1, 29 to 32, and you Note those sins there. And you're going to pray about the ones that especially challenge you. Or maybe you're in Paul's letters, Philippians or Colossians, and you take the written prayers of Paul, you be in the first chapter of each epistle, and you, in your own words, pray the thoughts of that scripture, that I might be filled with righteousness, Paul said, that I might discern what is pleasing in God's sight, that I might be filled in, with the fruit in every good thing, that I might approve that which is excellent, that I might understand God's will. These are the things in Paul's prayers. And then specifically, oh, it's easy to pray generically. I've sinned, Father, forgive me. But to get down to the particulars, helps me to acknowledge those matters in my life and to seek God's forgiveness. Confidently, as Rhonda's niece was told, God hears you. He may, in a sense, be far away, but his ear is right here. Pray with courage. Pray with boldness. Pray with a sense of security. And then pray consistently. Perhaps you have a room in your house, a closet that you cleaned out, or a corner in your bedroom, and a chair there, or a place you can kneel, and you have an appointment with God. Maybe it's first thing in the morning, and before you meet the issues of the day, you bring them all before his throne. Maybe you set aside, as some would say, the first hour of every day. Or maybe it's as the day goes on and you've got your paper in your pocket and you're jotting down those things that come up. And then as evening comes, you have a place and you have a plan. And maybe you have a list written out of the things that you want to pray about. The five-finger prayer is quite... Simple to remember. Praying for family and friends. The pointer finger, leaders and teachers. Government and authority. The weak or the sick. And the least finger. But important, do it not do without it. Praying for myself. Especially as we think about the mission God has given us and what is coming as we prepare for September 26th. We talked as we began today about the lights pointing up toward heaven. We want the light to come down from heaven into every heart and every life and every city and every nation. God has put that light within us. We read in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4 that through us, someone said to me just last Lord's Day, Corey, would you preach soon on the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Because the influence God can bring about through our transformed character, only He can measure or estimate. What is your need for the Lord? When a person converts to Christ, in response to the gospel, 
and is baptized after turning from sin and confessing his name, it is in a sense a request. Peter calls it the appeal for a good conscience. Asking God, cleanse me, take away the guilt and the shame and the failure. If you would respond to learn more about becoming a Christian, or if you have a concern that you'd like to bring before us today that we might pray for you, we would be so pleased to do so. Come, we stand and sing.